Let me know. Yep. Okay, we're live. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I see we've got more folks joining us uh, via Zoom. I'm sure there are folks watching uh, at home uh, and also on the live stream. Uh, so excited for you all to be here with us. Um, this is our second uh, virtual town hall uh, for small businesses and nonprofits as well. Uh, and so I'm gonna do a little bit of an intro uh, and then um, we can actually just get started. Um, let me just make sure that there's no one that needs to be. <clears throat> okay, I think we're good to go there. Um, I need to probably do something about that. All right, so let us get going. What do you say? Um, hello, and thanks for being with us today for our second virtual town hall for Brookline Small Businesses and Nonprofits. Uh, my name is Raul Fernandez. I'm a Brookline Select Board member and chair of our Small Business Development Committee. I'm joined today by other members of our committee and town staff, including Brookline's Economic Development Director, Kara Bruton, and Economic Development uh, Planner, Meredith Mooney. Uh, we've also got some special guests joining us, which we'll introduce in just a little bit. Uh, but first, a few quick words about the Small Business Development Committee for those who weren't with us last week. Uh, the SBDC was established uh, in the fall to study and recommend methods to incubate, launch, recruit, and sustain small businesses. Uh, our membership consists of small business owners with representation from the Economic Development Advisory Board, the Brookline Chamber of Commerce, the Coolidge Corner Merchants Association, uh, as, and the Brookline Village Business Association, as well as residents by, like myself who are invested in maintaining thriving businesses and communities in Brookline. We have three subcommittees and they're focused on the regulatory environment for small businesses, uh, the experience in commercial areas and support for businesses owned by women and people of color. Uh, like many of you, our work has taken on new meaning in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and public health crisis. Uh, when thinking of how we could best respond, we decided, among other actions, to host these virtual town halls to hear from those most affected by the crisis. Uh, I want to impress upon those of you who are joining us that our primary focus today is to share information with and to hear from small business owners, nonprofit managers, and employees. All others are welcome to watch along and may ask questions at the end if time permits. Uh, I do want you all to know that this meeting is being recorded and will be shared publicly after it's concluded. Uh, also, there are just a few essential functions in Zoom that you should be aware of. Um, first, the vast majority of you are currently set as attendees. If you're in the Zoom environment, that means that your videos will be off and your mics will be muted unless I, as the moderator, allow otherwise. Um, you're welcome to participate in the chat. You'll see a little chat button down there. And you can write to other attendees and even the panelists. Um, however, should you want to ask a question of any of our panelists, you'll need to use the Q&A function. So please look for that Q&A button in your window. Uh, you may also view and upvote questions that you think should be prioritized. Um, you'll see both those chat and Q&A Q icons alongside others, um, probably at the bottom of your window. Uh, remember that this continues to be a fluid and evolving situation. We're going to share as much information as we have to date, and we'll do our best to answer your questions as fully as we're able to at this time. Uh, what we most want to hear today is about what you need right now and how we can advocate at the local, state, and federal level to make that happen. Uh, so before turning things over, uh, let me talk briefly about the town's response to date. Uh, Brookline COVID's, uh, Brookline's COVID-19 task force led by town administrator Mel Kleckner and health department director Dr. Swanee Jett in consultation with the select board is taking direct action to slow the spread, flatten the curve, and protect residents uh, from contracting COVID-19. Uh, the town of Brookline has declared a public health emergency. Uh, in addition to our task force, we've established a local civil defense organization led by Fire Chief Ta uh, John Sullivan, uh, which has also given us additional powers to protect the public. Uh, we've also advocate, uh, activated our Advisory Council on Public Health, which has met regularly and publicly to address community health concerns and to help inform our response to the crisis. All schools, libraries, and town buildings are currently closed to the public, as are the Senior Center and all playgrounds and play structures. All town related events have been canceled for the foreseeable future and no gatherings of 10 or more people are permitted in businesses, houses of worship or anywhere else. The only exceptions are grocery stores and pharmacies. All businesses deemed non-essential have been closed by order of the governor or ordered to operate remotely. Um, all restaurants and eateries in Brookline are prohibited from serving dining customers until further notice. Uh, restaurants do have the option and they have taken this up, which is great to provide takeout and delivery service. 
based on requests from small business owners, 15 minute pickup and delivery spots, uh, parking spots have been designated around time, town by economic development staff in consultation with our transportation administrator, Todd Grant. The town has also asked those conduct conducting construction projects to voluntarily suspend those projects. However, a recent order from the governor made clear that construction projects must be allowed to continue, albeit under safe, uh, strict safety and social distancing rules. Also, the Brookline Police Department will not be in enforcing the following parking regulations during the town's COVID-19 emergency. Uh, they will not be enforcing two-hour parking zones, the overnight parking ban, or parking meters. All other parking violations like fire hydrant, handicap, crosswalk, bus stop, other violations will be enforced. All town business continues to be conducted, albeit virtually. Uh, we're close to determining, to determining what to do about our upcoming election and town meeting in May. Uh, decision uh, regarding the election is expected at our next select board meeting on Tuesday. Uh, if you've been watching the spread of this virus, you already know that this is a real threat and we're acting accordingly. Uh, as of the last night, the CDC reported 54,453 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the United States. New York Times reports even more than that. Uh, and that's up from less than 9,000 just one week ago. As testing ramps up, we're seeing more um, confirmed cases uh, out there. Um, there are currently 1,159 confirmed cases in Massachusetts, including 20 cases right here in Brookline. That's up from 18, I'm sorry, eight confirmed cases this time last week. Uh, we also have two firefighters that have tested positive for the virus, and we've taken additional measures to implement cleaning and social distance measures in all of our firehouses. Uh, this is an important reminder that our first, response, first responders and other essential staff are out there every day working to keep us safe. We all owe them a debt of gratitude for their service. Thank you. Also, it must be noted that this is not just a virus that older people can get. While older people remain at gravest risk worldwide, a recent CDC report found that 38% of those who required hospitalization in the U.S. were aged 20 to 54, and nearly half of the 121 sickest patients, patients studied those admitted to intensive care units, half were adults under 65. We've got a lot of work to do to stop the spread and succeeding in this critically important effort will require your active support. In addition to the restrictions that I've just mentioned, we've also issued guidance related to social distancing, which means staying at home unless absolutely necessary and staying at least six feet apart from anyone who doesn't live in your home. We've also been reminding people to wash their hands regularly and in addition to use hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. I wanna make sure I repeat this and say this loud and clear, you can pass on this virus even if you are asymptomatic. That means you can feel and appear completely healthy and still have this virus and give it to others. That goes for the generally young and healthy as much as anyone else. There's also evidence that, th that suggests that the virus can live for a time in the air and on surfaces, which makes social distancing and regular disinfecting even more critical. Information on this and everything I've shared to this point is available at brooklinecovid19.com. That is a site for official, up-to-date information on Brookline's response to this crisis. Once again, that's all one word, brooklinecovid19.com. Uh, with that, I'll turn things over to Kara Bruton, Brookline's Economic Development Director, to introduce our first speaker. Kara, take it away. Good morning. This is Kara Bruton. I'm the Economic Development Director for the Town of Brookline. Um, and this morning, we have Pat Maloney joining us. <clears throat> He's recently retired and brought out of retirement very quickly. Um, he's the Director of Environmental Health for the Town of Brookline for many years. And it looks like he's working out of the Emergency Operations Center, maybe um, even this morning. <clears throat> so we may see some people walking around behind him. Um, he's one of those that are working hard out in the field. I thought it would be helpful for Pat to join us so businesses can hear directly um, how the town takes the language that the governor laid out on Monday <clears throat> as far as non-essential businesses closing and um, encouraging other businesses that are non-essential to try and um, continue to operate remotely <clears throat> as long as safety precautions are taken into place. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Pat and if you wanna introduce yourself. Hi, and uh, excellent overview uh, to uh... Uh, Paul there, that was uh, very concise. Yeah, all the points that we've been trying to sell, so uh, outstanding. Can everyone hear me? Yes, good. So yes, I'm up here at the EOC. We're working very hard. Uh, what we're doing at the EOC are answering questions and we're getting 
a variety of questions and concerns from individuals. So if you do uh, have uh, a concern or a question, you can call 617-879-5636. Uh, that's where for general questions. If people have medical questions, we're handling them at the health department at 617-730-2300. Um, we've been working with um, economic development for many years and uh, doing what we can do to uh, uh, promote our businesses and make sure they're functioning. This is a very challenging time. We've uh, strategized on, on what, whatever the health department can assist with. What we've done is we've issued um, guidance documents. They're online where uh, it gives you guidance on how to clean and sanitize your facilities, your establishments, centering on the high touch points. That's what we get many calls about, uh, people concerned about uh, you know, cleaning and, and, and are the high touch points being sanitized. And we're getting excellent compliance. We're doing spot checks at many facilities and uh, we're pleased with our findings. Uh, we uh, are also going out and doing spot checks when we get calls with uh, the police on the essential uh, business uh, facilities and, and you know, we're educating also on that. Some don't realize if they are or are not eligible to be open. So we have uh, instruction sheets for that. Uh, there is an appeal process if somebody feels they are deemed non-essential and um, that information is online and at the end of the information is uh, a form that people can fill out. The town does not uh, give the accommodation for if you're essential or not, it's the state. So that form gets filled out and it's online and it gets sent to the state. Um, just as a, a, a person who's worked in the town for over 34 years, I'm, I'm just really pleased with the response of the community the citizens, our businesses, and every department, it's all hands-on. We're all working together to get through this, and it's um, uh, an outstanding um, effort. We're getting calls from other towns asking us, how are we doing this? They, they, they're they impressed with our EOC and our on-call lines and our what we're posting, and it's because work has gone on for many years planning for events such as this. So. Uh, kudos to everybody uh, uh, participating. So uh, I'm here today if there's a particular question um, related to uh, your business or uh, if there's something you want to uh, discuss, well, I'll see what I can do in this forum. And if we need to go offline, um, we can do that. You'll, uh, I'm sure Carrie will post my uh, email and I'm back on with the uh, Town of Brookline email system. So we could also do that for individuals. Thank you. Does anybody have questions for Pat? Hi, Pat. This is David. Um, I've got a couple of questions. I don't know if this is directed to you or if we're, are we going to be having a discussion from uh, the attorneys later on? Yes. Okay. So in that case, I will probably hold these questions for uh, to them. One question I do have is and that I, somebody David, you go ahead um uh make sure you introduce yourself this is david lashinsky the owner of eureka puzzles and the um is it chair of the coolidge corner merchant association yes thank you um pat one question i had is once um, a business does submit a form uh, to change their designation from non-essential to essential is there any guidance from the state about how long one would anticipate getting a response from them yeah, I, um, I would hope they would have a. I would hope they have a quick turnaround. Uh, I could imagine them getting swamped with this, but by posting it and um, having a, a, a way of doing it, they they got to be ready to try to give that turnaround as soon as possible. But I, I don't have any guidance on that. I'm sorry. I have a question over here. Um, my name is Melissa Topper Goldman. I'm one of the owners of the Village Works co-working space in Brookline Village, and I'm on the leadership of um, the Brookline Village Business Association. I know that there are still um, 
Brookline restaurants that are doing deliveries with high social contact, meaning there's card swipes involved and people face to face. Um, I'm wondering, is that allowable? And is um, the town helping facilitate ways to eliminate that as a practice and help businesses um, get beyond that? Because that um, I know that's happening with people in um, high risk groups as recipients who may not know that they're signing up for some some face to face contact. And um, I just want to know how, how that's being addressed. Yes, yeah, so um, yeah, we have a variety of uh, businesses attempting to comply with our social distance requirements and, and sanitation requirements. So uh, in our spot checks, if we see something that, uh, for example, they don't have a sanitizer readily uh, available where the swipes occur or where somebody's going to be signing or hitting the, the uh, ATM uh, device, um, we, we you know make them get it right away. Uh, we did, uh, I went out with the health commissioner the other day and, and did some spot checks and what he was impressed with was, were businesses that set up a system for takeout where you call them, uh, they take your money over the, you know, they'll do a, a phone exchange with a credit card and then they'll put, they have a table in the front of the establishment with and your name on it uh, and you would pick up your product. That was impressive because it eliminated all of that uh, issue. Um, not everyone is equipped to do the, the over the phone cards amazingly, some of our small ma pop operations. So uh, the social distancing is what we're looking for. I'm seeing more, um, um, more businesses putting tables in front of where they're talking. So it's not just a counter, it's a counter and a table. Um, but yes, that's part of our job to do spot checks and give guidance. We're trying to be consistent with every you know, everyone throughout the state. It, it becomes more challenging for us if we do something much stricter and then in the three towns surrounding us, they're not, uh, it, it is difficult. So we were pleased when the, the governor's office stepped up and addressed a number of issues that were, were challenging for us. Um, for example, we right away suspended our um, polystyrene and and, and plastics bylaws because we knew there would be a real rush with um, persons trying to get takeout containers and they're so difficult. And we know they were having difficulty with getting composted ones, so that's suspended. And with the governor suspending the plastic bag uh, ordinance uh, throughout the Commonwealth, that makes it easier also because a number of grocery stores were um, uh, not allowing people or giving people a little trouble if they brought their own bags. So, so I guess um, I'm just wondering how are you doing spot checks on people's delivery practices? I'm more I'm thinking also of the delivery where there's people are a delivery driver is coming to the door with a card swipe needed and um, people not necessarily realizing they were going to be face to face with the delivery person coming from the restaurant themselves. Like how how is that um, being looked at and managed and and you know working with the restaurants to encourage them to change the practice now? Well, we're, we're keep giving alerts and advisories and updates, but that's a good point because some of them are hiring third-party delivery services. So we'll make sure that they convey this concern and their obligation to uh, have sanitizer and disinfect between those visits. That's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. So um, Roxy is using the Q&A um, feature on this, and um, she is at the Puppet Show Place Theater. She's asking whether or not business owners can still access their property. And I believe the answer is yes, Pat. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, they can be uh, in their business and we have some businesses that are in their business um, where they're doing mail order uh, service and, and things of that nature. So that is permissible. What I would ask is that you put up a sign though on the front door just in case people see you going in and out. Uh, we had, when we were going out doing spot checks, some establishments, the people were in there, uh, they were closed to business without a sign. So it gave the impression they may be open. So to avoid any um, uh, uncomfortable circumstances, just uh, if I could convey to, uh, and we get the message out, put a sign up. I, everybody's putting a sign up, you know, under the circumstance with Corona, uh, virus were closed for the public health emergency. That gets the point across. 
uh, even if you're in, in the store. So they won't be knocking on the door trying to get you to open it up. I don't see any other open Q&A on, um, on the app. So any other questions from the Small Business Development Committee members? And then we can let Pat get back to his. <laughs> we did have a new question that came in there from Mary. You see that one, Kara? Oh, sorry, thank you. So um, Mary's asking um, that she says she called Brookline Public Health regarding Bornwood Hospital continuing to run the six hour outpatient day program with 10 to 15 kids in group sessions for adolescents, even as recently as early this week. She wanted to follow up to ensure that this was shut down and understand how that could possibly have been allowed to happen. Yeah, that would not be shut down. That is deemed an essential service. Uh, medical uh, facilities are still uh, allowed to operate there. They are of concern. Mental health facilities are of concern. Uh, but however, they are being instructed by their licensees and by the Board of Health here to implement the appropriate social distancing requirements and screening requirements uh, that are so they can operate safely and not uh, be a problem for public health. So a facility like that is allowed to be open. And it's, as a matter of fact, it, we're finding it's needed. Our calls are coming in. We're finding more mental health calls, more people are having concern as this uh, is, um, you know, day by day. Great. And Pat, before you go, can you just one more time give the phone number if people have questions about public health? Sure. First, I'll give the, uh, the general number, and that's at the EOC Center. And uh, what they do is they accept the calls, and if it's something we can't answer, we'll get to you, or it'll be forwarded to an appropriate department. And that number is 617-879-5636. And if you have a public health question, we have um, public health department uh, individuals, and we're getting help from the school department school nurses, and they're all manning lines, uh, covering lines, I'm sorry, 617-730-2300. Uh, and again, um, thanks to everyone. Uh, and, and as uh, the select board knows, this is a real team effort. And I'm, I'm just, you know, I've been here a while and, and to see it all go into place. And, and we're making our best uh, judgment calls at times uh, in the interest of public health continue to monitor the advisory on the webpage, uh, the coronavirus webpage, because we update that daily with uh, information. What we're putting together something now will be for uh, needy populations. The uh, pantries are stepping up, the food pantries, to try to uh, see what we can do to get uh, uh, assist people who are um, needy uh, populations to get food to them. So there'll be uh, some postings and information in that regard. Great. So, we, have, um, we have one last breaking oh, question um, from John Van sure, Skoyak. Yeah. Um, he's asking, what are the guidelines for essential versus non-essential construction activity? Um, the, the, the governor has, you know, put in his statewide guidance that construction uh, is, he's deeming it essential. So uh, he did not break it down saying this type of construction or that type of construction. And I will say at the EOC, and I, I know the uh, uh, the town administrator's office and the select board, they've been getting a number of calls on this. But this is something that, um, uh, you know, is still allowed to go on. What our building commissioner has done is he's contacted all of the uh, permit holders. He Everybody has a permit, so he has access to them, and he's, it, uh, advise them, you have to be screening your staff, you have to be checking them, have your internal policies. It's required uh, under this emergency, as well as it's required under OSHA. Uh, and in addition, they have to practice social distancing. And if they can't do that, then they can't do that segment of the work. So um, the building commissioner is having his staff go out also and doing spot checks to make sure they're following that protocol and and that they're um, complying with what we want. So, but at this point, uh, construction is uh, allowed. They did not divide that into essential and non-essential. Thank you, Pat. I think we're gonna wrap up. I think you're, you might stay on the phone.
phone, but um, I just want to thank you so much for taking time out to join us this morning. And um, Meredith, did you want to give some announcements to everybody really quick? You're on mute. Oh. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. Sorry. Starting over. Meredith Mooney, Economic Development Planner. Um, so just to give you a quick recap of what we've been up to for the past week, we've been having dozens and dozens of um, phone conversations, email exchanges with Brookline businesses to answer questions, help identify information or resources. Um, we welcome those calls. Please feel free to reach out to me or Kara. I'll include our email addresses in the chat section. Um, we're happy to chat with you. And if we don't know the answers, we're um, here to serve as a resource. So we'll try to find helpful information or point you in the right direction. Um, also, we've been working very hard to try to keep our resources page updated. Um, there are a lot of developments every day at the state and federal level. So we're trying to make sure that Brookline businesses are aware of the resources that are available to them. I'll also include a link to that website in the chat section. A um, couple of headlines. Um, the town has deferred all facade loan program payments due between now and June until August 1st. We hope that that's helpful to um, Brookline businesses as they're uh, working their way through this incredibly challenging time. Um, and also, um, I know that uh, accessing unemployment assistance is probably something that um, you're all you know someone who's either applied for unemployment benefits or is in the process of doing that. I think we're gonna have a panelist uh, in a couple of minutes talk about um, that process and answer any questions. Um, but I did participate in one of the Department of Unemployment Assistance uh, virtual town halls. Their goal is to do those town hall sessions daily to answer any questions. Um, and I found it very helpful and it sounds like they are overwhelmed with uh, claim applications and questions at the moment, and they're working diligently to scale up their staffing resources. Um, so I would advise patients, um, and if you do have questions for them, I think their call center operations are currently down, and they have a, a specific form that you fill out, submit to them, and then they'll get back to you. So if you are um, really would like some questions answered immediately, I would say submitting that form is your best bet, or maybe participating in one of the virtual town halls. And I'll include links to all of that and to the website where we have that information posted as well. That's all. Great, thanks, Meredith. So um, maybe Raul, you can just look for a minute. I see that Dave Robinson is has joined us and Stephanie Boudreau has joined us. I don't yet see from my end um, Julio Cortez, Delomo, or Jennifer Gilbert. I don't either. I see a, a Jen on there. I'm not sure if that's uh, Jen, but uh, Jennifer Gilbert or not, but. Okay. And is that by phone? Um, it's just in the attendees list. It's not possible. Okay. So if they are on and can reach out to Kara and let us know what their, what their name is uh, in the, uh, uh, in Zoom, that'd be helpful. Or um, just chat us. You can chat us in the in the box there and let us know. Oh, okay, Jen. Let's, Jen, different Jen. Yeah, let's just wait. I see Julio now. We know Stephanie's on there. Are you muted if you're talking to us? <laughs> thank you. So again, my name is Kara Bruton. I'm the Economic Development Director. I want to thank the attorneys that are joining us this morning for the second half of this weekly meeting. Um, there's some burning questions about <clears throat> how do businesses can best protect their employees, especially those that are most vulnerable, um, including ones that might have upcoming immigration hearings or extensions of their visa. Um, the, we also received a lot of calls around unemployment 
in employee benefits. So we have um, Dave Robinson with that. So just real quick, um, Julio Cortez de Olmo is an immigration attorney here in Coolidge Corner, and his practice exclusively specializes in U.S. immigration law, including citizenship, humanitarian asylum, removal, deportation, defense, and talent-based green card applications. Dave Robinson is joining us from the law firm Roberto Israel and & Weiner and is an expert in the unemployment and employee benefits. He represents a variety of retail, restaurants, service providers, and financial institutions. Stephanie Boudreau is an attorney at Bob Allen's office here in Brooklyn Village and focuses on landlord, tenant, and lease questions, which we've gotten a lot of those types of questions as well. She represents clients in a variety of commercial disputes and bankruptcy matters, as well as business-to-business -business transactions. And finally, Jennifer Gilbert um, is also an attorney at Bob Allen's office. She previously served as town counsel for the town of Brookline. And in addition to municipal experience, practices and issues related to litigation, employment, and tax law. Um, and hopefully she'll be joining us in just a minute. So we want um, this part of the session to be as useful as possible to our business community. So um, what we'd like to do is just immediately turn it over to uh, Q&A from the businesses, and then um, I will try and field it, um, the question to the attorney that could probably most, um, most likely answer that question directly. Let's see if we have any questions coming up. Okay, so first question is from Liz Linder. She's, um, this is probably a question for Dave. Um, she is talking about how she's an S Corp and is an employee herself. She's applying for unemployment. Um, the business is losing money and all the contracts have been canceled. Um, she's working to stop the money from bleeding and strategizing through this. She's never filed for unemployment and the questions are um, unclear. She's trying to figure out how to report her hours, which translate to dollars. In other words, um, I think what she's trying to get at is what percentage should be she be paying herself versus um, applying for unemployment? And if you can give any suggestions for her as an S corp, um, that would be helpful, Dave. Okay, um, that's a lot. Uh, yeah, uh, it's hard to say how much she should be putting in there. That's really a business decision on whether she she can't pay herself anymore. I mean, again, if the company is is in shutdown mode, but like for temporary. You could pay yourself nothing and apply for unemployment, but they're going to delve deeper into that given that you're the owner. So I think it's a tricky situation and it's largely probably it is not a regularly dealt with one by me or by the, the division of unemployment. So I think uh, it's probably should talk to your accountant, uh, try to figure out a plan going forward on how you're going to continue to pay yourself and your and employees if there are any. And then you can, when you have that plan, you present that to the Division of Unemployment Insurance Assistance and see what they're going to say in that. I hope that was helpful. It's a little hard without having the, the, all the specifics of your situation to really answer with specifics. I don't see any other questions um, yet. Let's just... I have one. Um, actually, I got a number that I've heard about from my um, um, constituents. So in addition to filing for um, as an individual owner who happens to be um, um, running an S corporation, what happens for uh, looking through my list here? If you're trying to if you have to cut down on the hours for your business, it would be better to um, furlough your workers. Uh, versus laying them off. Um, what happens in terms of the claims that are coming back against the company itself in either case? You mean the unemployment claims, I assume? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so as far as I'm aware, there's no law that changes how claims are assessed against the company. So even though this may be unprecedented until I see some legislation, and there may be some in the stimulus bill that's, that's now being chugging through Congress, um, but at this point, I have not seen anything that 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 liberalizes the employer's uh, rates. So whatever has happened at the end of this, very likely you should anticipate that there's going to be an increase in rates for unemployment, because that's typically what happens when you start drawing down on your unemployment funds. Mm -hmm. um, going back to uh, can you, what was the original question attached to that? I'm sorry. Um... I think the original question around that was, um, 
Oh, furlough. I'm sorry, furlough versus oh, laying you know, off. furloughing versus just saying you're laying them off. So, so furloughing versus laying off is is at this point the, the difference between the two. First of all, layoffs pretty simple. You're terminating your employees with or without a, some sort of assurance that you're going to hire them back when you reopen. Um, it's pretty simple. You're terminating them. You pay them their any PTO that or any vacation that they've accrued but unused. Um, and then they're separated from employment and they can immediately apply for unemployment. A furlough it, it varies greatly from my client to clients. Some clients continue their benefits during the time period. Some, some uh, it, it do some sort of work share arrangement where they're having employees do reduced hours. Some are temporary shutdowns. With the liberalized uh, div division, the 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 GUA has liberalized applying for unemployment. So if employees are out for any reason, whether or not they're coming back to work, they can apply for for unemployment. So that's now allowed. So in this situation, if you furlough them, you they could still collect for unemployment, and all they have to do is they have to report. So for instance, if you're in a work share arrangement where they're doing reduced hours. They have to report that the hours that they are getting paid for, what they're getting, they have to pay the what what income they're getting paid for. So that would then be deducted against their unemployment. So that might be a way, a strategy where you're not entirely closing for business, such as a restaurant that's now just doing takeout. You could you could reduce your your overhead by having employees share their hours versus just laying off a certain percentage of your staff. So that would reduce potentially reduce your unemployment hit. And as well, it could it could keep your employees in your business. And that's the real advantage of furloughing versus layoffs is at the end of this, you need to reopen and re bring these employees back. If you lay them off, there's nothing stopping them from going to finding a new job. Whereas if you furlough them, they may, they may stick around and they may wait for you to to rehire them. Yeah, there are issues from what I understand um, is it sounds like if you are laying them off, um, you're also going to be bleeding more cash because you're going to have to pay the unused vacation benefits and any sick time that they've accrued. So therefore, it takes a greater hit to the business versus simply furloughing them. That's uh, that's order. that's correct regarding laying them off. To be honest with you, I think it's a gray area legally whether you'd have to pay their un their 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 accrued but unused vacation time. I I think it's a dangerous position to take. Yeah. It's because it's gray. It's not. There's no because the point is you've stopped employing them. You may. I think it, it's better if you are doing reducing their hours. I think you can clearly say that. But if you're saying you're no longer working at a minimum, you have to allow them to use their their paid time off. And, and in a furlough so situation. Is, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. This is Jennifer DePazzo Gilbert. I, I joined a little late um, due to technical difficulties, but perhaps I can give an example of a small business that I um, um, assisted sort of through this. This was um, a company with less than 50 employees that was doing really well. They had a retail side of the business and then they had um, um, a growing uh, wholesale side. And the wholesale side was keeping them alive. Um, there was a, it's a coffee shop, independent coffee shop, not a chain. Um, they were doing fantastic until this hit. Uh, they ended up um, shuttering the doors and just closing up. And um, they laid off all of their retail side um, and decided to just keep the folks that were working on the wholesale uh, distribution end. And the reason they did that was to, again, just what David said, there was a gray area and a question on the risk as to continuing contributions, both on the 401k plan and other benefits. And so these workers on the retail end were laid off. Fortunately, um, my client was able to give a $1,000 payment to each employee that he laid off along with all the um, new unemployment, unemployment um, information so that they could sign up immediately for that. Um, the other thing, and I don't know if it was discussed before I got on, that $1,000 employment or if anybody's giving any type of a stipend as they're laying, determining to lay off employees, it can now, um, as a result of the president's declaration, be considered 
um, a tax deduction for both the employer and the employee if it's deemed uh, to be related to living or personal expenses and not merely lost wages. So that that there's some great information on the IRS um, uh, website. It's called Section 139. Of it's a, considered a disaster relief payment now. So there are some tax benefits there if that happens. Um, so. so so related to that, Roxy is asking a question. Um, she says that there are 501c3. They're trying to understand, as we all are, the new national relief legislation provisions about forgivable loans for businesses that mm -hmm. keep making payroll. This is something that we've read in the um, news articles that are coming out as we speak. Um, and she's particularly trying to figure out if they would be penalized for their handful of hourly staff who mostly work as ushers for shows. There's clearly no actual work for them, but is it better for them to keep paying them something to allow them to qualify for forgivable loans? Or would furlough the, furloughing them be enough to um, potentially qualify for those forgivable loans? Yeah, I, uh, the only, you know, that everybody's going through this now and, and uh, you know, um, Attorney Robinson may have some more information on this, but it's my understanding that you have to keep your, you cannot lay off um, in order to qualify for that, uh, forgive the for, forgivable loans. And that's the information I have at the moment. Um, yeah, if I could jump in, we we looked at the original bill that was that was proposed, and in that one you had to basically what they did was they took a snapshot of your payroll last uh, March, and I think it's March through June, and then they compare it against your March through June period that now, and if your payroll is less, then you lose your you don't get the forgivable status. So if the, the hard part is because this legislation is evolving. Like, so for instance, that bill was a 300 page bill. The bill that passed this morning by Senate is almost 750 pages. So, and, and the House's version of the bill is 100 and is 1,400 pages. So unless the House just ditches their stat, their, their bill and simply adopts the Senate, which may happen, we're gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of reading to do over the next couple of days. So it's, it's hard for us to, to read the tea leaves here and say, this is what, what's gonna happen going forward. And I think that's difficult for businesses because you're trying to make decisions because you're looking at where we're at now. But my, my advice to clients is if you can hold on for the week and see what happens, then you may be better off. But if you have to do what you gotta do, you gotta do it. Don't, don't be waiting because it could not pass. And then we're back to square right. one and you're a week behind the eight ball. You know, you're a week further along paying out cash that you didn't need to be paying. And, um, and for folks that want to keep up to date, Kara, the, the, I, wanna, um, I find a really good timely site with the applications and everything right there for small businesses. The U.S. Small Business Administration, um, they seem to keep pretty up to date with um, what, what's happening in, in D.C., and they have the applications and a description of the bridge loans and what's available. So um, I'm happy to uh, provide that to, to that website to folks if they don't already know about it. Thank you. And Jen from Cards and Co. Um, wanted to clarify that for if you furlough your employees, doesn't that mean that you still have to pay for health benefits? I would say yes, you do because they're still employees, and you still still have to provide the benefits. You do. It's not just health benefits. Depending on how you've written your vacation policy, you may be they may still be accruing vacation during this time frame. So if you have a that's if, right. Yeah. So I think you have to look yep. at all your benefits and say, do I have to continue to carry these? And does it make sense to do so? And Mary is asking whether both 1099 and W-2 employees can apply for unemployment. 1099, there's no such thing as a 1099 employee. That's an independent contractor. And if they're properly, if they've been improperly categorized as a 1099, you, they can apply for unemployment, but you're going to, as the employer, you're gonna get whacked for not paying unemployment into them. Um, Massachusetts has a very strict statute on independent contractors um, for even under, under unemployment. So I think you're, you need to assess whether these people are properly categorized as independent contractors. Um, but if they are, then they can't apply for unemployment. 
Okay. I'd like to um, change gears a little bit. Um, and Raul, can you make sure that Julia's unmuted? Um, we've we've gotten several questions from businesses who are just trying to look out for their most vulnerable employees. Um, some we we have learned, you know, may not have had the proper paperwork, um, proper documentation, and are now scrambling. They are um, being told by um, members in their community to not um, apply for unemployment as it may put them at risk. Um, and so Julio, maybe could you just give some kind of general advice about what you're hearing right now in the Boston area and any advice you could give to business owners as they're trying to weigh whether or not to furlough or lay off employees that may, be, um, that may have citizenship concerns? Sure, thank you. So what, what I would say is that if it's a condition to be legally um, authorized to work, to be able to apply for unemployment benefits. So if the person has an employment authorization document under any of the many categories that there are, um, they should be able to apply for unemployment benefits. So that, that shouldn't be a concern. Um, another, a different question is if they are, you know, being paid cash, I don't know what the situation is, if, if they are really not authorized to work legally and they are just being paid cash. Um, in that sense, I mean, they don't qualify for unemployment benefits, of course. Um, they cannot even apply for those. And when it comes to, uh, I don't know if anybody has any concerns about the new public charge law. Um, some, some people are concerned that if they apply for unemployment benefits, that is going to affect them uh, applying for a green card in the future or becoming U.S. citizens. It really depends on the type of case that we're talking about, on the type of employment authorization, on the uh, situation under which the non-citizen is uh, working. Um, because if they are, for example, asylees or people applying for asylum, um, that public charge law doesn't apply to them. If they are uh, green card holders, um, it, it shouldn't be a concern because it doesn't apply for green card holders applying for citizenship, whether they take um, unemployment benefits or not. As long as they pay their taxes every year, uh, they shouldn't have any issues applying for citizenship down the road. Okay. Uh, and I, yeah, that's, I think, definitely helpful as like a broad brush and a specific question on this, um, and it, you may have already answered this, but just to state it more specifically, one of our businesses um, has a question here that they have a talented worker on an O visa. She's from Venezuela. She's an employee. Um, um, I'm sorry, she's an employee, but the business owner is also an agent. Um, but it's unclear if the employee is allowed to do work beyond her skill set. Um, this is in photography and, and post-production um, artwork skills. If she's not, if the a photographer is not able to employ her, um, is she in danger of being deported? Her the owner's current strategy is to keep her on for reduced hours as long as um, possible. Um, she the owner was told that if she does collect unemployment, it will raise a flag for her future status when she reapplies. Um, but given this crisis, are you expecting any leniency on that? Okay, so. As I said, if somebody is legally authorized to work, they should be able to apply for unemployment benefits. Um, so I don't think that applying for unemployment benefits is going to affect this worker. Um, I think as long as the relationship with the employer continues, I don't think that that should affect her. Um, she's an, I'm, I'm just rereading the question. That's an agent. I mean, she's not in danger of being deported. I mean, as long as the old visa, uh, as long as she's maintaining the status, um, going from falling out of the status to deportation, is, it's, I mean, there's a big difference between those two. Um, I would say that as long as she maintains the uh, relationship with the employer that is sponsored the old visa, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, this is all kind of developing as we speak. So, but what I do know is that somebody who's working lawfully can collect uh, unemployment benefits because of course that's why they, they pay taxes and that's why the employer pays taxes on that. 
Okay. So one last kind of follow up on that. Would it, would you guess that it would be more beneficial for that employee if she was furloughed rather than laid off to demonstrate that ongoing relationship with that employee? Probably. Yes. Okay. Probably that and, would be a good idea. Okay. Thank but you. I, but I would also advise, I mean, if she is really concerned, um, maybe she should make an appointment, not, not with me, but make an, a, a consultation with um, an immigration lawyer to go over the details of the specific business and the area of activity and uh, kind of discuss what the plan is going to be. Just right. to, to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks. Right, because every case is different. Um, exactly. I appreciate that, thank you. Okay. Um, changing gears a little bit again, um, we have a question about, um, is there any advice that you all can give our businesses about how to approach a landlord about rent relief um, do they do they have to pass on any relief they get um, taxes deferment etc so for an I'm going to fill in a sub a second question here um, there is as I understand it pending state legislation um, from Governor Baker that if it passes would allow municipalities to defer property tax um, payments if that happens since many of our businesses, are um, have that property tax rolled through and they're responsible for paying it. Um, is there is there any? Um, I don't. I don't. The question is: Do they have? Do the landlords have to pass on any relief that they get? Jennifer, do you want to take that one? Or yeah, Stephanie? let me take the tax piece, and then um, Stephanie will um, give. give we we've put together some. We've been helping a lot of landlords and tenants um, through this crisis. So Stephanie can talk a little bit about that and has put together a few pointers and tips. But on that on that tax piece, you know, it's going to depend on on how, the devil is always in the details. So if the legislation that is passed says that it's optional for for um, for property owners to take that you know, deferral and pass it on, or if, they, if it's not addressed, you're going to have to look to the exact language of the lease. You know, if the if deferring your taxes means that you're deferring it, but you're deferring it um, at with an interest rate, even if it's a reduced, in, reduced interest rate right now, you know, the statutory interest rate on um, real estate taxes for municipalities is, is very high. It's like runs at 14% and then it goes into 16% once once the municipality files a foreclosure. So it's a very high interest rate. If the deferred tax payment comes with um, an interest rate, then some landlords may not, um, if it's not addressed expressly in the statute, they may not agree to uh, defer and pass that option through to the tenant. So we're gonna have to wait to see what the language says. Um, if it's mandatory, in other words, if if the if you do get a break and you take that deferral, then you must pass it on to your tenant. Um, then it's going to depend on whether there's interest assessed on that deferral. I suspect there will be some interest, and it won't just be, or or at least it, there'll be a time frame um, along with an interest rate. So more to come on that. Um, but Stephanie, why don't you go over the the tips and pointers that you put together uh, for this call. I think they're really helpful. And maybe you can talk about um, especially the force majeure clauses that, that folks may have in their contracts. Um, is, is she muted? I don't think so. No. She might have stepped away for a second. Okay. Well, um, I can I can uh, fill in until she gets gets back. Um, so, um, for tenants um, with with more than one place of business, um, we would recommend that you prioritize. Right, if you have a below market rent, um, uh, you want you want to make sure um, that if you're up for an extension, that you reach out to the landlord and that you extend under the same terms. Um, we've also told folks that be very careful if you have force majeure provisions 
Um, a lot of a lot of people that have reached out to us think that those are um, what we call common law provisions and benefits that are available. Those actually must be expressly within the lease. And they can't be or shouldn't be invoked anticipatorily. In other words, we think that we're not going to be able to pay the rent in a month or two months, and so we want to use that force majeure provision now. Um, so we are telling people to avoid uh, making that anticipatory claim. There has to be some um, causation, some force that then you say, will excuse your payment. Obviously, for most small businesses, this is one of them. But you want to make sure to look at the language in the actual lease, or even if it's a goods and services type of contract. Um, so uh, Stephanie's just telling me she'd like to speak, but she's not able to. Uh, so let me see. Uh, Hold on one sec. Um, the other thing that we're we're um, looking at with landlords, we're telling tenants to reach out to the landlords. A lot of our um, small business, we we handle a lot of restaurant and pubs and bars um, in the greater Boston area. We're telling folks to reach out directly to the landlords to try to develop some type of a short-term strategy. Most landlords have, are, we're also advising landlords that in, in the event that they're able to come up with a short-term strategy, that they um, suggest actual language and put it in a written document because when this is all over, there's going to be a lot of question on how long was this in effect, how much um, was taken either off the rent or was this simply a, a deferral? Um, so, you, And the other thing, too, is landlords often have uh, mortgage contracts and provisions in their mortgage documents that they have to abide by. So it needs to be, in most situations, a three-way conversation where the tenant should reach out to the landlord. The landlord, in turn, must reach out to any mortgage holder they have. And if there's a change in the lease terms, the mortgage lender must be notified. Otherwise, the landlord, if any of you on the call are a landlord, you could be also um, found in default. Um, the other thing that we're, we're recommending is if you, are, if you were about to sign a lease or move in, uh, to a new facility when when this uh, pandemic broke. You want to be sure to see if you can delay occupancy for 90 days. Um, the landlord is going to want that. You're going to want that so you're not looking for an, and incurring the costs on, an, on a new place. A lot of, on the residential end, um, more so, we're getting inquiries about deferring perhaps the month of April and using the last month's rent. We've gotten a lot of questions about that. Again, that's an agreement that you can come to. It should be in writing and signed by both the tenant and the landlord. Where it gets a little bit tricky is with the security deposits. Um, we had um, a property owner in Brookline that had a lot of uh, foreign students who were suddenly kicked out and sent, kicked out of the colleges and sent home, right? And they wanted to then um, uh, break the lease. And in exchange for breaking the lease, they wanted, they, the, the tenants themselves, authorized keeping the last month's rent and also the security deposit. Gets a little bit into a gray area with the security deposits in Massachusetts because the law is so, so strict. And if you do not comply to the letter of the law with the security deposits and their return, you can be, uh, the landlord could be liable for treble damages. But if you're trying to break a lease um, and want the security deposit to be held in exchange for an agreement um, on that breaking of the lease, what you should do is take the security deposit back and then cut the check back to the landlord so there's no question. There is um, one case um, on point that was decided years ago which said that if the security deposit was kept by the landlord under an agreement, it, it, it wouldn't subject that landlord to treble damages, but the landlord still had to return the security de uh, deposit regardless of that agreement. So we're recommending that if folks come to an agreement, 
they should give the security deposit back and it should come back to the landlord if that's part of the uh, settlement for breaking the lease. Um, Thank you. So there's are, a, a, sure. a question. Yeah, there's a different question um, on the Q&A, kind of changing gears abruptly here. But just briefly, Kara, can we just check in and see if, if Stephanie's back with us now? I, I'm going to try to talk. Stephanie? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. OK, sorry about that. So, that Stephanie, um, I was going over some of the tips and pointers and gave a couple of examples of specific situations we've been um, dealing with, but um, I don't know if you heard me or. So I heard some of it. Um, I didn't hear all of it. Um, I will say that um, I don't know if you talked about the stay for residential evictions. I don't know. I know this is a business call, but there is a um, stay for residential evictions and any non-payment cases have been continued until at least April 22nd. But for commercial um, tenants now, for landlord and tenants, there is no relief in place. So payments are still due. And Jen, if you covered this, just let me know. But what, um, what we're recommending to both landlords and tenants is just really trying your best to keep an open line of communication. And a lot of times that's going to be a three-way line of communication with landlords, lenders, uh, landlords, and tenants. And just trying to be creative and come up with ways if you are struggling um, as a landlord paying your mortgage, as a tenant paying your rent, um, to find creative ways to... Um, approach the situation because it is so novel. Some of the things we're seeing um, landlords and tenants do is defer um, rent, reduce rent with an ex in an exchange for an agreement that once business and life resumes, um, you switch to a, a gross sales rent and um, have that some some form of gross sales percentage rent in place until um, whatever was deferred is repaid and do it kind of on a sliding scale to give the tenant a chance to get back and to give the landlord a chance to recover its losses. Um, so that's Stephanie, one of the that's a good seeing. option. Do you want to just get it get into the weeds on that a little bit more because I think it's a creative option that if the landlord is willing is is something that might really work for a struggling tenant who may have re, you know reduced business but is still operational and hoping to get back up and and running. Um, why don't you why don't you discuss that a little bit more for the folks, the tenants, business tenants that are listening? Yeah. So especially with um, we see it a lot with restaurants with the gross gross sales um, percentage provision in a lease where. Uh, let's say you have a base rent provision and a gross sales provision. Um, if you um, say to the landlord now, let's reduce or defer any payments due under the lease, except for maybe, you know, utilities that have to be paid that are that are still running. Um, and once we are up and running, we'll pay you um, a percentage of our sales starting slowly you know, so you can shift the slide, the percentage up and, uh, for a period of time. And then until the landlord is, you know, getting its money back and then slide it back down to go back to where it was. And um, the one thing I'll say about that is whatever agreement, and, and this is just generally, whatever agreements are come to with a landlord, even if it's, you know, not a handshake, but an elbow shake, um, they, they should be reduced to writing, right? Because things are just changing so rapidly. So make sure whatever agreements are reached are, um, are reduced to writing. And again, we are really stressing communication because everybody is going through this. It's not that it's not like some of you are struggling and some of you are not. The landlords are struggling. The tenants are struggling. Talk to your landlords. If you, if you, you know, if you can call them, if you can email them. Yes. Yeah, and I think for both parties, if whether you're a landlord or a tenant, and you do you do come to some agreement, um, 
as as we've both said, the landlord needs to check with any any mortgage uh, any lender that that's impacted by the lease agreement. So they're going to get need to get the lender to sign off. But anything that you do reduce to writing should also because the law there's so much legislation pending and things are going are changing. You know, as we speak, that written document should have a a line at the bottom that it doesn't preclude. Uh, either party from revisiting the terms of of this temporary agreement should there be any new legislation um, um, passed impacting either party's rights, right? So that if all of a sudden, you know, you come to some agreement where you're going to defer the rent for, for one month and then there's something passed that says landlords must must defer for three, you want to be able to go back and, and visit it and don't want to necessarily be bound by that initial agreement. So just keep yeah. that in mind. And I don't, I don't know if there are landlords on the call, um, but there are some suggestions for landlords who are looking to rent or you know enter new um, tenant agreements now. And Jen, I don't know if you covered any of this, but some of the suggestions or recommendations are um, if you are renting in particular residential spaces, don't show um, rented units. So if you have a prospective tenant, show them pictures, show them other empty spaces, but do not go into a unit that's occupied by others that they may be leaving to show them. Um, Pre-screen pre renters before you meet with them to see if they've recently traveled or show any signs of sickness. Um, limit any showing in common areas and minimize exposure to any other residents. Open doors before showing, clean, you know, just do the obvious sanitation and by cleaning doorknobs, handles, and suggest that the prospective tenants don't touch anything, walk in, walk around, and walk out. Um, um, there's also recommendations for um, property managers. I don't know if that's relevant for this call, um, but if anybody has, if anybody is managing property or has recommend or has questions about how to um, best approach uh, making sure that the tenants or residents are safe, um, feel free to email me. We have lists of um, suggestions on how to minimize risks and reduce potential liability. Um, I see that Tally has got her hand raised. Sorry, Tally, I couldn't, I'm not able to see that from where I am. Do you have a question? I think Tally is muted, and I don't know if that's on Raul's end. Or, there she goes. Hi. <clears throat> um, well, this actually, this question was a while back. It was for David while he was speaking. So is that okay, or I can wait to the end? Yeah, that's good. Um, good. Okay, cool. So um, I had a question because um, the the um, advice to you know with this new bill, whether we're um, we're laying off or we're keeping employees on. So for instance, like I laid off a bunch of my employees, um, you know, two, you know, two weeks ago at the start of um, last week. Um, and now I'm wondering, should I be rehiring them? Is that something I'm going to be looking at in terms of, should I be rehiring them in order to um, essentially to be getting these, um, you know, tax, the benefits of this new bill saying that if I'm using um, you know, this money for, um, uh, to pay my employees, then, um, you know, I don't need to be paying it back. And obviously I want to be paying my employees. Um, most of them have been able to file for unemployment, but obviously are not making what they were making. So is there going to be a suggestion to, to employers who already laid off their employees, um, to rehire them? I'm going to give you the classic, uh, lawyer's answer. It depends. Um, basically, it's going to depend on what the statute says. If the statute says very, if it's a very strict, if you've laid off employees, hiring them back isn't going to save you, then probably you probably would not be advised to do that. But if it, one of the things that I've been kicking about is whether you could hire back up and and still have the and, and still keep the same numbers if it's just purely a pay, if they look at how much payroll you spent in March of last year versus March of this year. 
you might be able to swing it if it's not. We're looking at employee counts and they're looking at, did you lay anybody off during this time period? Then probably not. I'm hoping they built in some flexibility in the statute, uh, but it's unclear right now where it's at. We're still in the process of analyzing the bill and we're hopeful that the that the house isn't going to go make a ton of changes to it. But there's no guarantees with just, for example, the uh, coronavirus relief act that was passed last week it started off as a very broad statute the leave provision started off very broad and applying to a lot more people when it ultimately was passed it narrowed it significantly to who who it applied to so i suspect that that could occur here as well so just be be very mindful don't you can't really act based on what's coming down the pike because that could, whatever comes down the pike could evolve substantially over the next few days hey okay, thank you sure um stephanie there's a follow-up question for you which is um one of the businesses is asking do you have a rule of thumb that you could offer for doing the gross sales percentage um, ramp up? Is that is there kind of any language that you've done or would propose as kind of a starting point? Um, we are, I'm happy to provide somebody kind of offline language. It really depends um, a lot on what your lease says now. If you're already paying gross sales, you know, what, what kind of lease provisions you have in place and how it would work what your rent is, what kind of income you're going to be, you know, what kind of revenue you're going to be seeing and how quickly that's going to start up. So it's hard to say, I, I can't really give you a specific language for a lease, but I could, I'm happy to look at a lease and try to help formulate something that works um, in the situation. Generally though, I mean, it would just be you know, based on earnings and revenue coming in, um, depending on what you think you'll be able to afford. You want to make it, you don't want to, you don't want to do like pie in the sky where you're promising as soon as you start back up that you'll be able to pay what you owe. You want to be realistic, but also, you know, make it palatable for the landlord who you're asking to give you a, a deferment for now. And, um, Meredith, I might be catching you off guard a little bit here, but did you also want to talk about how businesses could also reach out to SCORE members um, to try to work through some of these issues? Yes, so and we have a SCORE volunteer on the line, um, Steve Silverman, or is he no longer on the line? Um, but he's a member of our Small Business Development Committee and has said our encourage businesses to reach out to SCORE Boston to connect with um, counselors. It's free counseling support um, if you're troubleshooting issues with your business. And there's a link to that on our website and I can pop a link in the chat section as well. Great, and that's a, um, that's a free service, I believe um, all volunteers from, most of them have, I think all of them have owned their own businesses, um, but it is a free service. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for offering to follow up as well. That's really helpful to come together as a community. We have um, a question from the real estate um, sector. Um, someone's wondering whether real estate professionals are considered essential. Um, she says that she runs a sales and rental team of about 10 people with a large number of sales currently in process, live listings. Um, sellers have pressures to sell. Buyers need to buy a home because they've already sold their current one. Um, clearly open houses are out but she's unclear about the rest of the process being allowed in this environment. Um, purchase, purchase and sales are essential for many real estate professionals. Can anybody comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I can comment in so far as um, we know that the legal team in our office that does transactional work for purchase and sales and even refinancing, um, th those are considered essential. They're right in the list um, on that exhibit uh, A to the governor's order that legal um, services in connection with real estate tra transactional type of work are, are, are deemed essential. And I would um, 
unless unless another attorney uh, has heard otherwise, I think that the brokers that we've been dealing with um, are doing so remotely, but they're involved in the final uh, transactions as far as putting the paperwork together and sending it digitally over over to us and so forth. And they're doing a lot, um, as Stephanie said, by um, showing properties uh, by video or, or photo and then just doing the documents um, um, remotely and then getting them to the attorneys for the closing. Then closings are still going forward and it's up to whether the whether the folks feel comfortable um, coming in to sign where they need to sign still uh, in front of a notary because we're, we're waiting for relief on that particular piece that hasn't been issued yet. So we've had Clients coming in that are okay with it, you know, with with a, with keeping the six foot distance and passing things around with lots of Lysol and bleach wipes around, but um, those that aren't need to get uh, continuances and from the lenders. Great, thank you. And we still have two um, open questions about furlough versus um, unemployment, or you know, holding on to employees on payroll versus laying them off. Um, and I just wanted to, I think we've kind of come across that a couple times now, but Dave, is there, could you please just kind of generally one more time talk about the difference between furlough and lay, laying people off completely as far as what the um, legal issues are, what the pending federal, whether there's any um, advantage with the pending federal language coming forward. Um, anything else you want to add? This is the question we get daily. So any advice you could give again would be helpful. Sure. You and me both. I've been getting <laughs> this question from almost every client that's kind of in this situation. So basically, again, the a layoff is very simple. You're terminating all your employees or whoever you're actually laying off. They're terminated. You're treating them as if you normally would. You may give them some sort of assurance that you're going to hire them back. But as far as they're concerned, they're no longer your employees until you hire them back as essentially new employees. So it would be just like you treat them just like you would terminating any other employee. Um, a furlough is a, is kind of a, it's a unique concept. It used to be only used for the most part by the federal government when, whenever there was a budgetary crisis and they couldn't sign the budget, they would furlough employees. So they'd be unpaid during the time period, but they'd still collect their benefits. And ultimately, when they got hired back, when they signed the budget, they would be paid in whole for all prior days that were missing. Now, in the private sector, that's an evolving concept, and it varies from employer to employer. From some employers, it's more like a layoff with a promise to return them to work when things get better, or to employers offering benefits while they're on while they're on an unpaid leave, and it varies greatly from from client to client. Legally, there are a lot of issues with furloughs because as far as the the wage act is concerned, if you're not paying your if you're or dealing with vacation, the issue is when you terminate an employee, you have to pay them their accrued but unused vacation. The issue here when you're furloughing an employee, is that considered a termination? Now, under under mass law, if you're a furloughed employee, you can get unemployment which would seem to indicate to me that, that, that they're terminated because that's typically when you can get unemployment. So my, my advice to clients is typically tread lightly if you're going to furlough your employees, make sure that you pay them their, their, their vacation benefits or at least allow them to use vacation before they, before they uh, go on unemployment. In fact, in some instances, I've told clients to, to put people on vacation to use up their vacation time over a period of whatever weeks they have vacation for, and then allow them to go on employment. That way you're not paying a huge, a large sum of money to all your employees as they're walking out the door. Um, the other issues with, with the new, there's a new statute coming out. I'm sure people have heard about it. It's the Families First uh, Coronavirus, uh, I'm forgetting the whole name, Response Act or, or whatever, but basically it provides two types of leave to employees starting on April 1st. And the leaves are basically coronavirus based. Are they, are they quarantined because they have the coronavirus? Do they experience symptoms because of the coronavirus? Are they caring for someone with the coronavirus? The biggest one that I see applying to most employees is though, is the, are they at home because their kids are at home from school or from their daycare being closed? Now, depending on what type of leave they get, basically under the statute first, they get two weeks of paid sick leave. 
Um, the payment is capped. And depending on on what what type of leave they're taking, the rationale for the leave, it's capped at different amounts. Um, and then and thereafter, there could be potentially up to 10 weeks of paid leave for parents with kids under 18 that are home because their schools are closed or their daycares are closed. So those could apply as well. It's unclear to me right now whether that would apply to furloughed employees. And that's why I think you need to tread lightly when you're thinking about this, because it's not as simple as just saying, I'm, I'm putting them out, but I'm keeping you. It's basically from an employer standpoint, it's having your cake and eat it too. Well, the problem is, is that could also be from your employee standpoint, they could have their cake and eat it too as well. So that's why my concern is the regs haven't come out yet. Um, so things could change rapidly in the next couple of days because next Wednesday, basically April 1st, I think that's next Wednesday, the days of blending together, working from home. <laughs> um, yeah, it's next Wednesday. Um, David, can I? Sure. David, can you hear me? It's Jennifer. Yes, I can hear you, Jennifer. Okay. Yeah, David, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to um, um, be clear, and maybe you can expand on this a little bit. When the regulations come out for the um, Families First Corona Response Act, it's my understanding that there is going to be um, the possibility for an exemption for small businesses, and that would be classified as 50 employees or less. Um, mm -hmm. But you do have to we do have to take a, a peek. There will be criteria attached to that. But if there are, I assume there are quite a few folks on the line that have less than 50 employees. So before panicking, um, you may qualify for that small business exemption. And we, we need to be um, on the lookout for the regulations pertaining to that. Yes, exactly. Frankly, for most employees, it's not really going to apply to them. In, but in this case, because it's a pretty limited statute on what it's going to apply. Um, but the, you're right. There is the potential. They did give the authority to the Department of Labor to create re in their regulations an exemption for small employers. However, it's based in my reading. There is a question and answer session that's been put up by the Department of Labor. And if you have if you're curious about the statute and what it provides, I suggest you go into the Department of Labor's website and look at it. And they do not mention a blanket exemption they just simply say for parties that are, are risking as a going concern so basically if you're going to go out of business by paying this leave then you're going to then then you don't need to actually comply with the statute now just so everybody understands because i didn't give a full full explanation of the act the act itself the way it's designed employers get a tax credit for every dollar they spend to qualified employees so to the extent you're paying out money at the next quarterly payment of your social security taxes, you would get a credit against that. So essentially while you're fronting the money and it could be a cash flow issue, it should be a negative, a net revenue neutral to the business. So, and if it isn't, so for instance, if you outlay the funds and it's gonna put you out of business, then you'd, be, you'd definitely be exempt. So there is, it isn't, so don't get crazed about it just yet. I just, but I, I wanted to put that out there if you're looking at whether you should lay off or furlough, that is a potential issue that you need to take into account. David, Stephanie, was there was a question um, about whether that tax credit and when that tax credit would take effect. So if people were, could people rely on it now or? Uh, I believe the tax credit for the, for this, for this leave would kick in on the next quarterly payment. So, and then, it, and, and it's interesting because the way the statute's written is, is that it's a fully refundable credit, which my understanding is that means that if you have more credit than you have taxes owed, you'd actually get cash, a refund, just like you would on your income taxes. But I highly strongly recommend that you talk to your accountants. They're going to understand this way more than I do. That's a little outside taxes outside my area. I know enough to be dangerous on that issue. Thank you. Are there any sure. other um, live questions? I'm looking through different pieces here. Um, Julio had to take another um, call, so he's no longer with us. Um, but Raul, I'm wondering if you could talk about some of the um, local emergency kind of safety nets that are being put in place, um, especially for residents or business business community, including employees or past employees, um, even ones that may not have the proper documentation. 
Good thing. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> we've been working closely uh, as a town with the Brookline Community Foundation. We'll have a um, sort of bigger announcement coming later this week, uh, but working with them on what has already been established as their safety net fund. Um, the BCF has long had the safety net fund. They work in partnership with the Brookline Center um, to, um, to sort of distribute the support that comes through that fund. And really what it is, is to help people that have fallen on hard times in, in sort of our times before COVID-19. Uh, and we're really ramping up support for that fund uh, because there are a lot of people um, that are hurting right now. They help uh, with support for covering um, rent for, for individuals, um, utilities, and, and other needs. Uh, so uh, if somebody can pop into the chat, the, um, the phone number, if you, if you went to the main page of the Brookline Center, for instance, that phone number is right at the top there um, where people can actually call or they can also email <clears throat> about it. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is that this fund is designed to support anyone that, um, that lives, works, or goes to school in Brookline. Um, so that actually includes, um, obviously, Brookline residents. Uh, it includes, in addition to students in the Brookline schools um, that are that live in Brookline, it also includes Metco families as well, uh, and it also includes employees of businesses in Brookline, even if they're not residents of Brookline. Uh, so, for those of you um, small business owners with um, with employees that have been impacted um, by um, by COVID nineteen in any way, all the different ways that we talked about today and others, um, they can actually request support through the safety net fund. One of the things that I want to make sure that we also make clear is that. Um, um, these funds are available regardless of documentation. Uh, so as many of you know, um, stimulus checks may be coming, but undocumented folks will not necessarily be getting those checks. Um, we know that um, unemployment uh, is available, but not to people, um, as was stated earlier, who may be getting paid in cash and may be undocumented. Um, the safety net fund does provide relief and support for those individuals. So, um, so please, please, please direct them there. Um, they also speak many different languages. So that's um, so, um, so that's a service that's available through them too. Uh, so that, that information is in the chat. The phone number is 617-277-8107. Again, that's 617-277-8107. Uh, I encourage um, anyone who needs support to reach out there. Uh, we're certainly going to be working as a town um, to better promote the safety net fund and also to build it up financially so that it can meet the really great need that's out there in addition um, to what's coming out of the state and federal level. Yeah, Raul, um, this is Jennifer. I'm uh, I'm also on the um, Brookline Community Foundation board. I'm a trustee, and last night we had a meeting, um, virtual meeting, and we are really, really uh, focusing on the safety net, both um, in the fundraising aspect and the distribution aspect, and are telling folks to, as you said, contact the Brookline Center who gets the bulk of that disbursement. If anybody um, can't get through on that line or, or wants to, um, someone else to call, they can reach out to me and I can connect them with our uh, interim executive director, Frank Steinfield. That's terrific. And Frank's been an absolute gem working through all of this. Uh, also, if anyone is out there listening and has the, the, the financial ability to support this fund, it is greatly needed right now. Those of us who can, I think, should give um, to be able to support um, those, those who are in need right now. So um, please do what you can, even if it's a few bucks um, to help support that fund. Um, just go to the Brookline Community Foundation uh, Safety Net Fund, you'll see it. Thanks. Great, I think we should um, close things up. I just wanted to thank so much um, all of our speakers, uh, Pat Maloney, as well as our four attorneys today, Stephanie, Julio, Jennifer and <laughs> Dan, David, 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 David. sorry. David. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, it was really helpful to have that kind of deeper knowledge related to um, unemployment and to have you join us. Um, the Chamber of Commerce was also, Brookline Chamber of Commerce was super um, helpful in connecting um, everybody together with such short notice to make this call happen today. So I wanna say thank you to Debbie um, and also to everybody on this call, um, clearly there's a lot of collaboration going on at a local level, um, just people just trying to help people out wherever they're at. Um, Meredith, is there anything else or Caitlin that you wanted to add before we before we disconnect? Yeah. Okay, Ra Raul? No, just thank you all. We'll keep doing this as long as there's interest in it. So you can expect, uh, I think around this time next week, 
uh, that we'll do another call. Uh, do reach out. Uh, you know, Kara and Meredith, Meredith have been phenomenal uh, in responding to concerns, individual and, and otherwise. So if you've got things you'd like to hear us discuss on the next call, please reach out to them and we'll make sure that we get it on the agenda. We pull together as we did for, for this call, um, you know, the, the, um, the experts uh, who, can, who can best respond to these questions. So let us know what you need and we're here to, to work with you and to advocate, you at, advocate for you at the local, state and federal level. Um, so whatever it is that you need, please let us know. We'll keep working. Great, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.